Hello everybody. So here we are today after a long time meeting each other live in the PYQ marathon for oral and maxillofacial surgery. So rather than taking conventional questions in a row, I have taken some questions from the PYQs of all the topics in oral surgery. In some topics, I have purposefully kept two, three or four questions overlapping. Okay, you will see as we proceed that in trauma or in um, certain related other topics, there can be one question which can be twisted and turned and asked in multiple ways. So basically, when you read the explanation of a question, how that explanation can help you answer the multiple types of questions from that topic is what I'm going to tell you now. Okay, so basically, if you read the explanation properly, you can answer 10 different type of questions from the same topic. That is what we are going to understand in this PYQ marathon. So let's begin. The first question is from orthognathic surgery. Which of these orthognathic surgeries needs a horizontal cut in the ramus? Is it EVRO? Is it SSRO? Is it IVRO? Or is it subapical osteotomy? Alright, to answer this question, first you should know what is the full form of these terms. So those who are revising, those who are reading properly, you already know EVRO is extra oral because it is done with an extra oral incision. VRO is vertical ramus osteotomy. We can take all your doubts during the session in the um, telegram group all right so the name itself suggests that it's a vertical ramus osteotomy the question is which of these surgeries needs a horizontal cut in the ramus so the name is only a vertical ramus osteotomy so how can it be a horizontal cut so this is wrong ssro ssro suggests the gital Split ramus osteotomy. Okay, when you do it on both sides of the ramus, you call it BSSO, that is bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. In that, we skip the word ramus, but it is understood that it's a sagittal split ramus osteotomy. Now, here the name is sagittal. But does a sagittal cut need a horizontal cut? Maybe. Let's see. Let's rule out the other options. IVRO. IVRO is same to EVRO. Just the difference is that it is an intraoral vertical ramus osteotomy. So it's a vertical ramus osteotomy, but it's done intraorally. So it is more or less the same vertical cut in the ramus that you can see here. So this is VRO or vertical ramus osteotomy. This is how the cut is placed. If you put it intraorally, it is IVRO. If you put it extraorally, the incision is extraoral. It is called EVRO. Okay. And the last is subapical osteotomy. The name only suggests subapical means below the apices of the teeth. So these are the teeth. If you can see in the mandible here, so these are the teeth. Subapical means below the apices of the teeth. So yes, it is a horizontal osteotomy. But is it a horizontal cut in the ramus? No. It is a horizontal cut in the body of the mandible. So again, it's a wrong answer. This becomes a wrong answer. Okay. So Subapical osteotomy, yes, it does need a horizontal cut, but that horizontal cut is not in the ramus, it is in the body of mandible. Alright, so the only option, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong. The only option left is SSRO, but SSRO also name suggests that it's a sagittal split ramus osteotomy. The question is asking about a horizontal cut. How do you explain that? 
the explanation for that is to put a sagittal cut in the ramus you first have to put a horizontal cut on the medial side of the ramus a vertical cut in the angle body region of the mandible and to connect them you have to connect them with a sagittal cut like this so for sagittal split osteotomy you have to put first you have to put a horizontal cut in the ramus which is the answer second you have to put a vertical stop cut in the body of mandible and you connect them with a third cut which is the sagittal cut and because of this cut the name of the surgery is sagittal split ramus osteotomy to do a sagittal split ramus osteotomy you have to put a horizontal cut in the ramus a vertical stop cut in the body of mandible and connect them with a sagittal cut so the correct answer to this question is sagittal split ramus osteotomy it's a tricky question because this is vertical ramus this is sagittal this is subapical none of the names have a horizontal osteotomy in it okay so you have to know the osteotomies the osteotomy lines that we do in evro ivro or in ssro coming to the next question a 10 year old child came to your clinic with complaints of constricted maxilla and absent left maxillary canine patient provides history of repair of cleft lip when he was 3 months old that means at the right time the cleft lip was repaired and cleft palate when he was 1 year old at the right time the cleft lip and cleft palate were repaired presently cleft of alveolus is present so he has a cleft of alveolus which is a anterior alveolar cleft between the lateral incisor and premolar region in the left maxillary canine area preventing the eruption of canine what will be the most appropriate treatment for this condition so we all know that after the surgery for cleft palate there is a restricted growth of the maxilla okay which is what causes the hypoplastic maxilla and because of the cleft in the alveolus there is no bone there is just a defect so a canine cannot erupt into the defect around 9 to 11 years of age that is the age of the child 10 year old child you need bone there in the alveolar region only if there is bone the canine can naturally erupt into the bone but in a cleft the canine cannot erupt so what will you do you will do bone grafting of the alveolus and surgical repositioning of the canine or you will extract the canine i don't think so it's a corner stone of the arch you would really want to preserve the canine you will first expand the arch and then bone graft after the surgical exposure of canine yes that is the correct approach wait till all permanent teeth will erupt no we all know that there is a timeline for each surgery in the cleft first surgery is of cleft lip which is done around 10 weeks of age around 3 months when the child was 3 months of age then the cleft palate which is around 9 to 18 months depends on the speech development of the child and the next surgery that comes is alveolar bone grafting after vpi and all those surgeries the next bony surgery which comes is the abg and the best time to do abg is the mixed dentition period is the mixed dentition period before eruption of canine okay so if you put a bone graft there and then later on you expand the maxilla there will again be a deficiency in that region so what we do normally is we correct the hypoplasia of the maxilla first whatever transverse discrepancy has happened you first expand the maxillary arch so that whatever defect is there it takes a final shape and after that in that defect you put the bone graft you expose the canine and you put brackets and then your orthodontist will pull the canine out with the help of those brackets and wires and bring it into the correct occlusion 
because the arch is already expanded usually by this time the orthodontic treatment has started so the correct answer is expansion of arch first then bone grafting after surgical exposure of canine i mean with it you can do both of the things together all right so that is the correct answer to this question we can connect with each other in telegram group all right 2023 premier telegram group i am on it so if there is any doubt any question that you want to ask in between you can just keep putting your doubts in the telegram group if there are no doubts just keep putting thumbs up after each question so that i know that you have understood the answer properly i am waiting for your thumbs ups <clears throat> okay next we come to trauma i put four questions together because they are related questions all the questions are related to the orbit so if you have read one question and its explanation properly you can answer all these questions so if this was a question asked in 2014 this was asked in 2015 this was asked in 2017 and this is asked in 2024 if you have read your pyqs properly along with the explanation you have revised that question 3 times before it appears in the in your exam this is just an example that i'm giving you all right that is why just doing question and answer is not enough you have to read the explanations properly so let's and this is just an example okay i am just going to tell you each question one by one trap door appearance is seen in which of these fractures okay you all have read that trap door appearance is seen in orbital floor fractures it's not seen in leaf fort one fracture it's not seen in bilateral condylar fracture it's not seen in all of the above you have learned this fact have you gone back and understood what is trap door fracture let me tell you if this is our orbit okay you can see that it is made up of the floor of the orbit is made up of the zygoma here so this is the zygoma or the zygomatic bone and this is my maxilla okay when there is a punch on the orbit or when there is a direct hit direct injury to the orbit there is a fracture in one of these bones or both of these bones so because of the impact of the injury the fracture opens and closes the bone separate i mean there is a fracture in between okay but because of the anatomy of the region there will be separations of bone and immediately there will be again coming reduction of the bones so it will be like this injury has happened maybe a ball a cricket ball has hit the orbit so it has all the buckling effect has happened to the infraorbital rim which is this area of the orbit and because of the impact the floor of the orbit fractured but the bones came along together because it's a resilient that is why it is seen more often in children because in children the bones are very the organic material of the bone is very high the bones are resilient they are elastic so there is fracture and again the bones have come back together what happens here is when this is happening bones are coming back together but in that process of separation and coming back together they are trapping some of the orbital soft tissues they are trapping some of the orbital soft tissues most commonly the inferior rectus or the inferior oblique muscle that is the most commonly entrapped soft tissue in a trap door fracture so what happens there is restriction of gaze vision is normal okay but because of the muscle is entrapped the extraocular muscle one of these extraocular muscles is not moving properly because of the entrapment there is orbit or the globe cannot move upwards or in one of the directions depending on which muscle is entrapped so that causes restriction of gaze 
The funny thing is that you can't even see a trapdoor fracture on a CT scan. It's a clinical evaluation. This fracture cannot be seen on a CT because in a CT, usually you see that the bones are aligned or misaligned. Whereas here, the bones have separated and come back again, snapped back. So, even a CT scan can miss a trapdoor fracture. How can you know that there has been a fracture of floor of orbit? By clinical examination, by checking the gaze of the patient. Okay? What is gaze? You have to go back to the recorded videos and listen to the recorded videos to understand the gazes of orbit. Alright? So, this brings us to the answer that trapdoor fracture is seen in orbital floor. Now, how do you treat an orbital floor fracture? Suppose there is a trapdoor fracture. What will you do? If the trapdoor fracture has only caused soft tissue entrapment, all you have to do, take the patient under GA, release the soft tissues. That's it. No other treatment is required. Only if it is a trapdoor fracture not causing any hypoglobus, not causing any loss of orbital volume, any increase in orbital volume, any loss of orbital fat. Agar koi kuch nahi ho hai, sirf trap entrapment ho hai, just release the entrapped muscle. Completion of treatment. Okay? But what if it is not a trapdoor fracture, but it is a blowout fracture of orbit? What is blow out and blow in? There are two other types of fractures of orbit. One is a blow out fracture and one is a blow in fracture. We will not talk about blow in fractures because they are very, very rare. Most common is a blow out fracture. What is blow out? This is your orbit. Within the maxilla is your maxillary sinus. Okay, so this is your orbital cavity. This is your sinus cavity inside your maxilla. Okay. When there is an impact on the orbit, mostly taken by the inferior orbital rim, the injury causes the orbital floor to fracture and dip inside into the sinus, the maxillary sinus. This is known as blown out orbit. The orbit is blowing out. The orbital floor is blowing out into the sinus. So what happens? All the orbital soft tissues, mainly in the floor of the orbit, like the orbital fat, the orbital muscles, everything goes and herniates into the maxillary sinus. Like this. The typical teardrop sign that we see on CT, which I have discussed multiple times in my videos also. So this soft tissue will herniate like a teardrop into the maxillary sinus. This will cause increase in orbital volume. This will cause hypoglobus. This will cause inophthalmos, that is the orbit going back, the orbit going down, the globe going down. This will give all the symptoms. Can you treat it just by putting the muscles back, putting the soft tissues back? No. You need something to reconstruct the floor of the orbit because it's a paper thin bone. You cannot put a plate on the floor alone. You need to reconstruct the whole floor of orbit. How will you do it? The best way to do it is a titanium mesh. You take a mesh made up of titanium and you put that full mesh inside till the key, or key area of the orbit. And you fix that mesh with the infraorbital rim like this. So it's like a mesh. I have shown these images multiple times in my videos. It's like this mesh of titanium which goes and is used. You can cut it into different shapes. They are available in prefabricated shapes. You can cut it and reconstruct the floor of the orbit. And how will you ensure that it stays there? You will just take a part of it outside into the infraorbital rim because this is a horizontal buttress. This is an area where you can put screws. You cannot put screws in the floor of the orbit. You can only put screws in the infrabital rim. So you put screws there, you put your mesh there and fix your mesh with screws on the infrabital rim. So that is the best reconstruction for blowout fracture of the orbit. 
Remember, examiner will test you. He can put a clinical situation just giving you the symptoms that patient has had injury in the orbit. The only complaint he has is restriction of gaze. That means it's a trapdoor fracture. The treatment required is only just free the muscle. This situation. Another situation, the symptoms will be anophthalmos, hypoglobus, herniation of orbital fat into sinus. That means it's a blowout fracture. What will be the treatment? Treatment will be reconstruction of orbital floor. And what is the best material? Best material is titanium mesh. Why? Because it does not need a donor site like iliac crest, calvarium or rib. It does not have any donor site morbidity. It does not have any shrinkage which can be seen in any of the autogenous grafts. And the long term results are better with titanium mesh. So that is the best material for orbital floor reconstruction. Okay. Another question on the same line. All of these are advantages of using titanium mesh over the autologous bone for orbital floor reconstruction. Except that means which of these is not an advantage of the titanium mesh. Better adaptability. Yes, that is an advantage. If you take calvarium bone, which is the next best thing. Yes, it is flat and it can form the floor of the orbit. But to adapt that calvarium bone into your desired shape is very difficult. It is much more easier to do it with a titanium mesh. Size of the mesh is more than the size of the defect can be chosen. Yes, you can. If the defect is 3 cm, you can take a 4 cm mesh. If the defect is 2 cm, you can take a 3 cm mesh. So depending on the size of the defect, you can choose the mesh accordingly, according to the size. So that is also an advantage. Long run to heal at the donor site. Obviously not because it is not an autogenous implant. It is an alloplastic implant. It's a metal. You are taking it from outside and you are putting it in the body. That is why we are calling it an implant, not a graft. So definitely there is no donor site morbidity in titanium mesh because it is not an autogenous thing. Good results? Yes, that is an advantage. So the correct answer is C. Long run to heal at the donor site. Obviously, there is no donor site in titanium mesh. If you have read your question properly, if you have read the explanation of this question properly, you will be able to answer this question. And I consider this as a repeat question because the explanation is repeated. The topic is repeated. So this is counted as a repeat question. And mind you, 60% questions will be repeated in exam in this way or in this way. So please read your explanations very, very properly. The last question in orbit is which of these is called the key area for orbital reconstruction? The correct answer to this question is posterior medial wall. Okay, we've discussed this in our videos also that this area, the posterior medial wall is where your graft is going to stay where your graft is going to go and get support from. So the posterior medial wall is basically your key area in orbital reconstruction. You will understand this better when you're actually performing surgeries. For now, you can just remember that PMW, not BMW, but PMW, the posterior medial wall is the key area in orbital reconstruction. Okay, so these are the four topics four questions that can come from orbit these are pyqs i have purposefully chosen orbit because it's relatively a little difficult usually you understand mandible nicely you understand the leaf foot nicely orbit is a little less understood so purposefully i have taken orbit i hope um, it's a little more clear to all of you just give me a thumbs up there if you understand everything or if it is a doubt we are open to doubts i'm just waiting for your thumbs up and then we go to the next questions in trauma. All right, very good. The next question is lag screw. Which of these is true regarding lag screw fixation? Any threaded screw may be used in lag screw fashion. Is this true? So this is a threaded screw. And this is a lag screw. 
All right. Can you use any threaded screw in a lag screw fashion? Yes. The answer is yes. How? If I drill this much hole normally and this hole wider, then this part becomes like this. It becomes a gliding hole and this becomes a fixation hole. Correct? This is the proximal part of the screw. That is the near part of the screw. And this is the distal part of the screw. So if you make the drill in the bone according to the screw size distally and wider than the screw size proximally, then even a threaded screw can act like a lag screw. So yes, this sentence is absolutely correct. Proximal bone segment has threaded hole. Proximal distal. Proximal segment has threaded hole. Is it right? No, it is wrong. Distal segment has threaded hole. Proximal segment has no threads. Distal bone segment has gliding hole. No. Distal bone segment has fixation hole. Proximal segment has gliding hole. Gliding, fixing. So this part, the gliding part of the lag screw does not engage bone. Only the fixing part will engage bone. That is why lag screw causes compression osteogenesis. So if this is my fracture and I am putting my lag screw like this, this part will not be with holes. This part will be without holes. The proximal part will be without holes. The distal part will have threads. Sorry, it will be without threads and the distal part will have threads. So only the distal part of the screw will engage the bone. And as I tighten the screw, the distal part will be pulled towards the proximal part, causing compression osteogenesis, which is why we use two lag screws in fixation of oblique symphysis fractures. And remember, the lag screw is always fixed perpendicular to the fracture and not perpendicular to the bone. That is the last option. Lag screws are placed perpendicular to the bony segment that they fix. Wrong. Lag screws are placed perpendicular to the fracture line. They are not perpendicular to the bone. They are perpendicular to the fracture. Due to this, sometimes the head of the lag screw stays over the bone. To prevent that causing injury, you make a countersink. That is the purpose of countersink which was asked as a PYQ in the next exam. Alright, so I hope you all know the concept of lag screw. If you have not understood it properly, you can go back to the recorded videos. We have taken up lag screw very very nicely. Basically, it is a screw which has threads in the distal end which will engage bone. It has no threads in the proximal end so it will not engage bone. The function of lag screw is to pull the distal bone fragment towards the proximal bone fragment and cause compression. The rules for using lag screw is that it should be perpendicular to the fracture line. So suppose this is my mandible and this is an oblique fracture in the symphysis. Okay, We usually use it in oblique fractures of the symphysis parasymphysis region. So this is an oblique fracture of the symphysis. How will I use lag screw? I will use lag screw perpendicular to my fracture line. When I do that, the screw head will stay over the bone. 
to prevent that from being palpated, to prevent that from causing injury in the bone, what we do is we make a counter sink. Counter sink means we make a receptacle for the screw head to receive the screw head so that the screw head is also sunken into the bone. That is the next question. In lag screw technique, what is the function of counter sink? Assures appropriate receptacle for screw head. Yes. It is a hole made in the distal fragment that engages the screw threads. No, that is the fixing hole. A hole made in the proximal segment that does not engage the screw heads. No, that is known as the gliding hole. It is non-functional. Absolutely wrong. The function is there. It assures appropriate receptacle for the screw head. Alright. That is the function of countersink in a lag screw. Okay. So this finishes question 7 and 8 in trauma. Coming to the next question. To treat a subcondylar fracture. Come on, now all of you will answer this question, okay? The images are slightly scattered here and there. To treat a subcondylar fracture, which approach is best according to you? A, B, C and D. Now come on, tell me, what is the name of approach number A? What are the names of A, B, C, D? And what is the answer? Which is the best approach for a subcondylar fracture? Something like this. What is the best approach for a subcondylar fracture? So, macrophage is saying that answer should be three preauricular incision. What about others? I am happy that I chose this question. Can you guys tell me the name of these approaches? What is A, B, C and D? So A is submandibular approach which is also known as a residence approach. Gauri and Jyoti are absolutely correct in their answer. Aparna, you are also correct. The correct answer is retromandibular approach. So A is a submandibular approach. You can see that the incision is there below the mandible. Okay. B is retromandibular approach. Retro means behind. Mandibular means behind the mandible. Okay. You all know that retromandibular approach can be anteroparotid. Or transparotid. Okay, it can be either through the parotid gland or it can be over the parotid gland. Anteroparotid approach or transparotid approach. C is preauricular approach. You all know auricle means ear, preauricular means in front of the ear, external auditory meatus. Yes. And D is bicoronal approach. Okay. So, bicoronal here, condyle here, it's too far. It's not a good approach for subcondylar fractures. Submandibular, still very far. The confusion is between retromandibular and preauricular approach. Now, I will make a diagram to explain you this fact. This is my mandibular condyle. If there is a fracture in the neck of condyle, or in the subcondylar region, my approach will be different in both the cases. If it is a condylar head, or a condylar neck fracture. I will use preauricular approach. If it is a subcondylar fracture,
I will use a retromandibular approach. See, preauricular has a clear cut scar on the face. Retromandibular, the scar is hidden behind the mandible. So, if I have to choose cosmetically, I will always choose a retromandibular approach. But with retromandibular approach, it is very difficult to reach the condylar neck and the condylar head. I cannot use it for the condylar head and neck fractures. But I can use it for subcondylar fractures very, very easily. Question is asking subcondylar fracture. So, my answer will be B, retromandibular approach. Is this clear with all of you? Yes, postramal and retromandibular are similar. Behind the ramus and behind the mandible, they are the same approaches. Okay. Lag screw is the rigid load sharing. Yes, it is rigid load sharing approach. If you use a single lag screw, it is not rigid. If you use two lag screws, it becomes rigid. Load sharing. Okay. M. I hope that clears your doubt. Alright. So, the correct answer to this question is B. Retromandibular approach. Okay. Submandibular approach, I will use. Submandibular approach, I can use for angle fractures, for body fractures. Okay. Retromandibular fracture. Uh, approach I can use for subcondylar fractures, angle fractures. Preauricular approach I will use for condylar head fractures, condylar neck fractures. You can see that with this incision, with this incision, it is easy to approach the head and neck of condyle, like we do in TMJ ankylosis surgeries. But if it is this kind of a fracture and I have to put a plate like this, then with this incision, I cannot put a screw here. The inferior most screws will be very difficult. Okay. And bicoronal to bhoat dur ho gaya. Okay. So, for subcondylar fracture, the best approach is retromandibular approach. Okay. So, that brings us to the end of trauma. And trauma is over. Now, we come to the temporomandibular joint. Again, just a tricky question in terms of use of words. Now, give me the answer to question number 10. The only definitive non-surgical airway possible in elective cases of TMJ ankylosis can be provided using. Now, give me an answer to this. It's more of an anesthesia question, but since a surgeon has to know the basics of anesthesia and it is related to ankylosis, I thought I should take it. It's a very, very repeated question. So many times they ask you about uh, approach to the airway in an ankylosis patient. Very good. So the correct answer to this question is fiber optic intubation. These are the keywords that you have to pick up in the question. Definitive airway. What is definitive airway? Any airway device which is present beyond the glottis. Beyond the glottis plus it is secured in that place. It can be secured with cuff. It can be secured with sutures. It can be secured with tapes. Anything. Matlab, the tube should be beyond the glottis and it should be secured there. That makes it a definitive airway. So, with direct laryngoscopy, video laryngoscopy, fiber aptic intubation, tracheostomy. With all these methods, you can put a tube in the trachea, which is beyond the glottis, secured there and giving a definitive airway. So, definitive, all are correct. Coming to non-surgical airway. Non-surgical airway, out. This is a surgical airway. Okay. Now what we are left with A, B and C. In elective cases means you have time. There is no emergency. Okay. 
क्वेश्चन इज ऑफ टी एम जे एंकाइलोसिस द प्रॉब्लम विथ टी एम जे एंकाइलोसिस इज रिड्यूस्ड माउथ ओपनिंग रिड्यूस्ड और इवन नील माउथ ओपनिंग ओके एंड लैरिंगोस्कोपी कैन ओनली बी डन इन अ वाइड ओपन माउथ सो सिंस देर इज रिड्यूज और नील माउथ ओपनिंग यू कैन नॉट डू डायरेक्ट और वीडियो लैरिंगोस्कोपी द ओनली ऑप्शन लेफ्ट इज अ नेजल फाइबर ऑप्टिक इंट्यूबेशन विच इज द करेक्ट आंसर राइट ऑल ऑफ यू आर एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट कुड यू शो द डिफरेंस बिटवीन ट्रांसपेरोटेड एंड एंटीरोपेरोटेड अप्रोच येस आई कैन शो इट आई डोंट हैव पिक्चर राइट नाउ टुमारो इन द मॉर्निंग मेंटरशिप सेशन आई विल शो यू बेसिकली इन द ट्रांसपेरोटेड अप्रोच there is a superficial and a deep lobe of parotid between them there is a plane you can go through that plane and reach the posterior border of ramus the only disadvantage there is a facial nerve there in anterior parotid you go over the capsule of the parotid gland anterior to the gland if you want pictures i can show you the pictures tomorrow in the morning motivation sessions next question question number 11 during gap arthroplasty trigeminal nerve stimulation causes what i want you to tell me the answer and the name of the phenomenon which is happening in these cases what is the answer and what is the phenomenon which is happening which is causing the answer yes correct answer is c bradycardia and the phenomenon is called tcr okay it is called trigemino cardiac reflex what is tcr very good vago cardial reflex Um, the more appropriate term is the trigeminal cardiac reflex very good so whenever there is especially during surgery whenever there is um, stimulation of the v1 or v2 or v3 there can be because of some cross innervation there can be stimulation of the vagus nerve and we all know that a uh, vagus effect on the heart is negative chronotropic so there is bradycardia and there is hypotension okay so in gap arthroplasty means you are doing a tmj ankylosis surgery so it is mostly mediated by the v3 the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve okay similarly if you are doing surgery for the orbital floor repair imagine there is a there is a blowout fracture of the orbit and you are doing a surgery in the orbital region the same thing can happen due to v1 okay same thing can happen due to the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve in that case it is better known as ocr or oculo cardiac reflex same thing is happening okay because of the v1 branch of the trigeminal nerve there is innervation there is some cross innervation with the vagus nerve and during surgery it causes sudden bradycardia sudden hypotension in the patient so the anesthetist is the one who will tell the surgeon to stop the surgery said please stop sir there is some bradycardia happening he will give some vagolytic drugs and he will wait for the um, reflex phenomenon to get over then slowly you proceed with the surgery trying to avoid the same maneuvers that were causing the tcr 
ओके सो द करेक्ट आंसर यू आर ऑल करेक्ट इज ब्राडी कार्डिया एंड हाइपोटेंशन कॉज बाई वेगल स्टिम्युलेशन ड्यू टू टी सी आर ओके नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन कमिंग टू मैग्जोरोफेशियल पैथोलॉजी अगेन वेरी वेरी रिपीटेड क्वेश्चन वेरी वेरी इजी क्वेश्चन A patient presents with painful swelling in the preauricular region since one month. That increases in pain and size on eating food. As soon as you read these words on eating food, that means it is related to some of the salivary gland. Ultrasonography reveals cyanolith at the hilum of the parotid duct. What should be the treatment? Come on. Question number twelve answers everybody. Very good. Yes, the correct answer is superficial parotidectomy. Let me just quickly tell you what is hilum. Okay, hilum is that point of any organ where major ducts, blood vessels leave or enter the organ. Okay, so suppose I am talking about kidneys. Okay, so this is the hilum of the kidney. where the renal artery is entering renal vein is exiting the ureters are exiting so where all the tubes enter or exit the gland that is known as the hilum of gland any gland okay if we talk about the salivary glands this area where the parotid duct leaves the gland okay is the hilum of the parotid gland the area in the submandibular gland similarly where the submandibular duct leaves the gland is known as hilum of the gland okay now there are two types of surgeries that you can do in salivary stone if this is my gland this is my duct and this is the duct orifice okay if my stone if my cyanolith is in the palpable region of the duct where i can palpate it i can remove the stone by opening the duct okay duct a uh, gland uh, sorry your um, cyanolith excision by opening the transductal removal of the stone you open up the duct you remove the stone and instead of this opening you make this as the opening new opening of the salivary gland duct you suture this part with the oral mucosa with the floor of the mouth and you create a new opening for the for the duct this can only be done if the stone is in the distant part of the duct near the opening but if the duct if the stone is in the hilum of the duct in this region or if the stone is in the substance of the gland you cannot remove it by milking or by uh, you know uh, your silagogues or by transductal removal the treatment for such cases is if it is asymptomatic no treatment if it is symptomatic then the only treatment possible is gland excision you excise the part of the gland which has stones few days back i had a patient in my clinic who had got a tooth extraction done and after the tooth extraction uh, it was a general dentist who did the extraction and he referred the patient in urgency to a maxillofacial surgeon and the patient from the dentist clinic came to me running with an opg saying that the doctor is saying that there is something wrong in my mandible there are multiple white spots in my mandible however i am perfectly fine i don't have any pain i don't have any swelling i don't have any issues what did he have he had asymptomatic submandibular salivary gland stones multiple small small stones in the submandibular gland but the patient was asymptomatic there was no pain there was no swelling that means the stone is not obstructing the duct it is a non obstructive pathology in that case you don't require any treatment if some day the stone travels and obstructs the duct then it can cause symptoms like pain during meals swelling during meals and if it gets infected then there can be abscess in that case 
you have to remove the gland the beauty with submandibular and parotid gland is these glands are made up of two lobes there are two lobes of submandibular gland there are two lobes of parotid gland a superficial lobe and a deep lobe so instead of removing the whole gland you can just remove the superficial lobe this is especially important in the parotid gland in submandibular gland it's okay you can remove the full gland also but the parotid gland is special this is the superficial lobe of parotid gland which is a bigger one i have made it a smaller one and this is a small deep lobe of the parotid gland and the terminal branches of the facial nerve 1 2 3 4 5 divide between the superficial and the deep lobe of the parotid gland so instead of calling it parotidectomy what we try and do is a superficial parotidectomy so if there are stones at the hilum of the duct here don't remove the deep lobe just remove the duct and the superficial lobe of the parotid gland why it will protect your facial nerve from injury that is why you don't do a parotidectomy you only do a superficial parotidectomy <laughs> and that deep lobe will shrink itself because it's disused disused atrophy it will shrink okay so to preserve the facial nerve we do a superficial parotidectomy that is the answer all right just give me a thumbs up you are all correct uh, most of you are correct in answering the answer is excision excision means you are removing the whole gland okay so i don't want to remove my whole gland so that is a not a very good option the better option is superficial gland removal or superficial parotidectomy milking is not possible you cannot milk a stone from the hilum and bring it to the a uh, stenson's duct opening no that is not possible or oh, wharton's duct opening it is not possible lithotripsy not a very successful treatment in parotid stones okay so the best answer is superficial parotidectomy okay coming to the next question again a repeated question what is the best indicated to treat a 1.5 by 3 by 3 cm ameloblastoma in the body of the mandible in an otherwise healthy young male adult patient now we all know that what is the treatment of benign odontogenic tumors we all know what ameloblastoma is a benign tumor this one is a small one okay the treatment of benign odontogenic tumors is very good all of you are absolutely correct here excision surgical excision of tumor plus 1 to 1.5 cm of adjacent normal looking bone plus the next anatomical barrier that is the treatment for benign odontogenic tumors you remove the tumor along with the tumor you don't just excise the tumor you also remove around 1 to 1.5 cm of adjacent normal looking bone because the tumor infiltrates into the adjacent bone and the next anatomical barrier so if the uh, tumor is restricted to the bone you remove that much bone and the next anatomical barrier that is the periosteum if the tumor has infiltrated and perforated the periosteum you remove the bone periosteum plus the next barrier which is the overlying muscle if it has infiltrated the bone periosteum and muscle you remove the bone periosteum muscle and the deep connective tissue which is there over the muscle so whatever is the next anatomical barrier that is free of tumor you excise that barrier also considering that there will be microscopic infiltration 
of the tumor into the next anatomical barrier also. All right. So very smartly, the examiner has played with your mind. He is just seeing if you are alert or not. Okay. Instead of centimeter, he gave you millimeter. Okay. So you will think, oh, 1 to 1.5 hota hai. Exam mein 2 diya tha or 10 diya tha. So 10 to bohat dur ho gaya. 2 is the closest answer. So let me mark 2. But the option is 2 millimeters. And the fourth option is 10 millimeter. And 10 millimeter becomes 1 centimeter. So this is how the examiner will play with your mind. Please be very relaxed in your exam. Please read all the words very, very carefully by putting a finger, putting your cursor beneath every word of the question, every word of the option. So you will never be wrong. I'm very happy. All of you have answered it correctly because I've discussed this multiple times. Very good. So the correct answer is D. Radiotherapy is not a treatment for amyloblastoma. 2 mm of bone margin is very less. Curettage, curettage will cause 80 to 100 percent recurrence because it is a, not a treatment for tumors. Curettage is treatment for non-tumorous pathologies like cysts. Okay, so your correct answer is D. Okay, space infection. All of these spaces are of high or moderate severity except this is a factual question. You know that all the pharyngeal spaces and um, all these spaces which can extend to the head, to the orbit, to the neck, to the mediastinum are severe spaces. And the simpler spaces are the primary spaces. Okay. So, perimandibular space, perimandibular spaces are around the mandible. Okay. Submandibular, sublingual, uh, retromandibular space. So, yes, these are moderately severe spaces. Submacetic space, again, a moderately severe space. Lateral pharyngeal space, high severity. What decides the severity? Proximity to vital structures. Number two and number one is threat to airway. The biggest threat to airway is the most severe space infection or proximity to vital structures like carotid artery or some vein, some nerve. So the more it is a threat to airway, the more severe it is. So correct answer to this question is buccal space. Buccal space infection is of low severity. Okay. I think I have that table with me also. Yeah. So low severity are simple primary spaces like buccal, infobital, vestibular, subperiosteal spaces. Not a big threat to airway. Not a big threat to any vital structure. <clears throat> Coming to moderate severity can hinder the airway due to swelling or trismus. All your, um, all your uh, masticatory spaces like submasetric, telgomandibular, temporal spaces and the perimandibular spaces, the three S, submandibular, submental and sublingual. And the ones which have high severity, which can directly obstruct or deviate the airway or are a threat to the vital structures, they are the mainly the neck spaces. Okay. The danger space of neck, mediastinal spaces, intracranial, if they are extending to the uh, to the brain, then they become very, very severe or extremely severe. Otherwise, your neck spaces are also high severity. All right. Yes, Jyoti, you are absolutely correct. The answer is C, buccal space. Coming to simple extractions. While removing a deeply impacted maxillary third molar, it may get displaced into Infratemporal fossa, maxillary sinus, both of the above, none of the above. Very simply, the answer is both of the above. Okay. We know this. This is simple because if, if, if this is my maxilla and this is my pterygoid plate, the medial and lateral pterygoid plate, then between my maxilla and pterygoid plate, this is the triangular area which forms the infratemporal fossa. Okay. And it can very easily go into the, see again, caval, 
मैक्रोफेज यू ओनली रेड ऑप्शन ए यू हैव टू रीड ऑल द ऑप्शन इट कैन वेरी इजिली गो इन टू द मैक्लरी साइनस ऑल्सो वाई नॉट can very easily go into the maxillary sinus also okay so the correct answer is b uh, sorry c both of the above now next question is when you are reading such a question it should come to your mind directly that okay what will i do if it goes into the infradentorial fossa i will explore and i will take it out what will i do if it goes into the maxillary sinus first you will check how will you check that brings us to the next question during extraction of maxillary second molar you suspect that a root tip now if a full tooth is dislodged you know that it is gone but if it is a root tip you don't know whether it is lying somewhere there or it has caused a oroantral communication where it is okay it is dislodged in the maxillary sinus how will you confirm whether it is an oroantral communication okay yes the correct answer is water holding test why not valsalva why is m wrong why not valsalva and why water holding what will valsalva do if the patient is closing the mouth closing the nose and blowing the air he will feel that the air is coming out through an oroantral communication and not coming out to the ear that is a subjective test the patient can tell you correctly the patient cannot tell you correctly depending on whether he is able to do valsalva properly or not it is dependent on the patient right whereas if i ask the patient to take some water you can all try this at home if you take some water and tilt your head down you will feel that the water can go out into the nose if you tilt it excessively but in a simple water holding if you put some water in your mouth and tilt your head the water will not come out of your nose unless there is an oroantral communication if there is a oroantral communication the water will go from the mouth to the antrum which is the maxillary sinus and from the maxillary sinus into the middle meatus of the nose where the maxillary sinus drains so water holding is an objective test doctor can see here patient can feel in option b only the patient can feel so the patient will ha ha kuch hawa to nikal rahi hai but he is in the middle of a procedure you are doing an extraction the root tip is dislodged you can't expect a patient to give you a proper test the best test is a water holding test all right is that clear with you m because your answer was b the correct answer is water holding test and if the water holding test is positive that means there is an oroantral communication you have to explore the uh sinus you have to take that root tip out and you have to close that communication immediately if it is a small communication less than like 0.5 cm or so you can just put sutures so the clot will hold the communication and close it if it is a big defect then you have to take flaps and close the communication immediately all right so that is the correct answer to question number 16 okay this is easy you can all tell me the answer to this which of these is the correct sequence of teeth from the most to the least commonly impacted that means you have to choose the most commonly impacted first and go to the least commonly impacted i mean it's a very simple factual question and you can tell me the answer to this we have discussed this in our videos also just waiting for all of you to answer now tell me the answer so those who are answering d please go and watch the exodontia videos of oral surgery it's popularly known 
that apart from the maxillary and mandibular third molars, the maxillary canines are the most commonly impacted teeth. Okay. But in option D, mandibular incisors. This is an absolutely wrong option. They are hardly ever impacted. Hardly ever. Because they are the first teeth to be replaced. How can they be impacted? They can be missing. They can be congenitally missing. But question is on impacted. So that becomes a wrong answer. So the correct answer is C. Mandibular third molars followed by maxillary third molars. But that is not there in the option. Followed by maxillary canine. Followed by the premolars. Followed by the upper second molar. That is the correct answer. So C is the best correct answer. Because this is not there in option. But none of the options are wrong. Whereas in D, this is correct. This is absolutely correct. This is also correct. But this is wrong. Okay. So see what happened here is. You know the answer. You know this sequence. But you don't know the fact that mandibular incisors are hardly ever impacted. Because of that, you make a mistake. So this is a repeat question. And the examiner can fool me by, you know, removing one of the options. What he is doing here, he is removing one of the options. And I am getting fooled. That, oh, maxillary or mandibular ke baat to maxillary hota hai. To hamne itna hi padha. Hamne aage padha hi nahi. Pura padhna hai. Okay. Mandibular incisors. Incisors are hardly ever impacted. This is the fact which the examiner wants to ask you. And he is not asking you directly. He is not asking you which are the teeth which are least impacted. Then the answer would be mandibular incisors. He is not asking you in that way. He is asking you in a very tricky manner. So please don't make mistakes in such PYQs. Read all the options properly. Okay. And it's okay if you are making mistakes here. It is absolutely okay. Don't make these mistakes in the exam. Okay. Next one. While giving the anterior releasing incision in a three-cornered flap during the third molar surgical removal, which of these structures has chances of damage? The question should be mandibular third molar. So question number 18, just write your question number and answer the question. So Gauri, Aparna, you are both correct. The correct answer is buccal artery. Okay. How? Jyoti, mental foramen to beta yaha par hai. Second premolar ke paas. First and second premolar ke paas. Okay. The mental foramen is present between the premolar teeth. And you are removing the third molar tooth. Why will it cause an injury to the mental nerve? It will not cause injury to the mental nerve. Okay, the question is, while giving the anterior releasing incision, which is the anterior releasing incision? This is my alveolar incision on the alveolar crest, number one. This is the alveolar crest incision. This is my anterior vertical release 
incision okay and this is my distal releasing incision if i put only distal releasing incision it becomes a triangular flap if i give both anterior and distal releasing incision it becomes a trapezoidal flap or a four cornered flap or an enveloped flap okay the facial artery gives off a buccal branch like this so if i give this incision like this inadvertently or i go too much deep i can cause damage to the buccal artery the question is anterior releasing incision okay so this anterior releasing incision can cause damage to the buccal artery if instead of anterior if the question would be distal releasing incision if the question was distal releasing incision then the answer could be lingual nerve more than temporalis fibers okay we tilt the distal releasing incision buccally okay instead of taking it medially medial to the ramus we take it laterally lateral to the ramus why to protect the lingual nerve and to protect the temporalis fibers from getting stripped and causing post operative trismus so that is the purpose of tilting the distal releasing incision buccally to give a buccal tilt to the distal releasing incision so you palpate the coronoid process you palpate the anterior border of ramus and you give an incision on the anterior border of ramus like this but as you go distally as you go distally instead of going on the anterior border of ramus you tilt it slight laterally you tilt it laterally or buccally it's more or the same laterally or buccally why do you tilt it laterally or buccally first to protect your lingual nerve second to protect the fibers of the temporalis muscle and to prevent the post operative trismus okay that is about the distal releasing incision the question is on anterior releasing incision that is done carefully to protect the buccal artery here all right facial lymph node फेशियल लिंफ नोड का कोई टेंशन नहीं होता अगर एक आध उड़ा भी दिया तो कुछ नहीं होता है उसमें और फेशियल लिंफ नोड द वेरी सुपरफिशियल दे आर नॉट बोनी डीप ऑल दीज सर्जरीज आर बोनी सर्जरीज देर इज लिंफ नोड आर सुपरफिशियल स्ट्रक्चर्स राइट यू विल नॉट एनकाउंटर द फेशियल लिंफ नोड हेयर दे विल बी एनकाउंटर्ड वेन यू आर डूइंग द सब मैंडिबुलर इंसिशन ओके सो इज एवरीबडी ओके विथ क्वेश्चन नंबर एटीन येस ज्योति आई न्यू यू नो द आंसर आई डोंट नो वाई यू आंसर बी so correct answer is b okay we have discussed this in the morning mentorship session surgical wound of transalveolar extraction mostly falls under which of these categories okay so we know that classification of wounds is clean clean contaminated contaminated and dirty infected okay these are the four class 1 class 2 class 3 and class 4 of the different surgical wounds or trauma wounds also so any wound which is open to any of the mucosal surfaces or any of the cavities cannot be a clean wound okay oral cavity anal cavity or your respiratory 
tract and your genito urinary tract okay oral or the gi tract so these both become the gi tract okay respiratory tract and genito urinary tract any incision or even a clean incision in any of these areas cannot be clean because there are organisms pre existing in these tracts so any incision any surgical wound in any of these areas will be either 2 3 or 4 it can never be class 1 class 1 means skin or mucosa other than these mucosae okay clean incision close properly that will be clean wound all these wounds will come under clean contaminated category surgical wounds if it has dirt other than the in uh, the commensal pathogens it becomes contaminated like for example if the trauma is causing some foreign body some glass has broken and fallen onto the patient's face and that glass particles are there in the wound or if the patient has fallen down and the gravel and all the mud and mitti and everything is there in the wound that makes it a contaminated wound and when that contaminated wound creates pus whenever there is pus or abscess it becomes a dirty infected wound okay so this is the general classification of wounds and any oral wound can never be a clean wound because it is in the oral cavity so most of the transcellular extractions if unless it is associated with a space infection if it has a space infection with it it becomes dirty infected okay so if it is not if there is no mention of any pus no mention of any contamination then the classification will be clean contaminated yes you are correct macrophage the correct answer is clean contaminated wound the last question in exodontia no the second last question 20 a 5 year old patient with rhd comes to you for tooth extraction you decide the tooth extraction under antibiotic prophylaxis when should you give the prophylaxis we all know we give it 1 hour before extraction the current guidelines suggest that 30 to 60 minutes before procedure i e prophylaxis so many questions are asked previously sometimes they will ask you the dose of agmentin the dose of amoxicillin is 2 grams 1 hour before surgery the dose is different in children the dose is different in adults um yes the answer is c all of you are absolutely correct and these are the guidelines we all know which are the procedures only four procedures 1 2 3 4 where you need prophylaxis no other procedure requires a prophylaxis i mean do you give it one hour before the surgery coming to la while giving your inferior alveolar nerve block which infection can be transposed to which of these spaces very simple question again we have done it multiple times so inferior alveolar nerve block is given through the medial pterygoid muscle this is the medial pterygoid muscle this is the lingula of mandible so you pierce the medial pterygoid or you reach the lingula of mandible so the space which is there between the medial pterygoid lateral pterygoid superiorly and the mandible laterally is the pterygo mandibular space pterygo because bounded by the medial and the lateral pterygoids and laterally by the mandible so pterygo mandibular space if you take a dirty needle if you take an infected needle or if you take a sterile needle but pass it through a dirty area you can carry the dirty areas contamination into the pterygo mandibular space which is a masticatory space yes all of you are absolutely correct 21 answer is b okay 22 these are miscellaneous questions mostly on instruments so tongue um, uh, the question is langenbach retractor and cat's paw retractor are used for retracting any soft tissue okay tongue is also correct nerves is also correct bony edges not so correct 
soft tissue. All the soft tissue. You can use it for retracting any soft tissues. So the best answer. Sometimes multiple answers are correct. You have to choose the best answer. So the best answer here is D. Yes, Jyoti, Keval, you are all absolutely correct. The best answer is soft tissues. Any soft tissue, okay? It can be a muscle. It can be the tongue. It can be nerves. Nerves, usually we use the nerve hook. Uh, nerve hook is a better answer. But yes, you can use the non-sharp uh, end of the cat's paw to retract the nerves also. Okay, so the best answer is soft tissues. Very quickly, I will show you how a Langenbach retractor looks like. So this is how a Langenbach retractor looks like. It has a 90 degree um, blade with a tip in the end to keep the soft tissues holding. And the handle has a nice hole, nice ring in between. So the assistant can put a finger in that ring and his fatigue, his hand's fatigue will be less. It is better to have that ring so that you can hold the retractor properly using your fingers and all that. And this is the cat's paw retractor. One end is like the Langenbach retractor but very, very small. And the other end is like the paw of the cat. You know, the billi ke panje jaisa. Paw means panja. Billi ka panja kaisa hota hai? Aisa hota hai. So it's like that, like the cat's paw, which is why it is called the cat's paw retractor because one end is like the paw of the cat. Okay, so these are mainly used for retracting the soft tissues. Cat's paw retractor, this end, you cannot use for nerves, you cannot use for tongue. You can use for hard structures sometimes, um, like if you have to retract the gallia or some aponeurosis, some ligaments, you can use the sharp end of the cat's paw retractor. All right. So, this brings us to the end of the PYQ marathon. I hope um, you guys have made most use of it. Just before we end this session, just give me your feedbacks on two things. All right, I really need your feedbacks. On first, how was your session? I mean, did you like it? If there was any problem, anything you didn't understand. And second thing, which is the most easy and most difficult topics in oral surgery which you feel. Okay, I am asking you because in case um, the exam is postponed, the exam will be postponed because by now the notification has not come and it will be postponed but we don't know how much it will be postponed. It can be in the end of March, it can be in July also. So. If you tell me which are the most easy and the most difficult topics in oral surgery, we can make some schedule for all of you. I mean, I can try and make the difficult topics more interesting or try to give you uh, a better way of explaining the difficult topics. So it will be a very good feedback for me because for me, everything is same. But I don't know how much you are understanding. Maybe exodontia is difficult for you or maybe cleft is difficult for you. So just tell me the most easy topics which you don't really require revision and the most difficult topics which you think you need more revision or more understanding. All right. And please do give me your feedback on the session also. All right. So we'll just wait for one minute. I have some, some people typing here. Uh, in case there is any doubt, we are open to doubts also. I am very happy macrophage that you find trauma easy. It's very good if you like trauma because trauma is the most important topic in NEET, in INI, in PG and even in senior residency exams all over the country. I think even, even in the world. Trauma in microfacial surgery is the most important topic. I am very happy that you like trauma and you find it easy. Okay, so space infection is difficult for you. All right, so I will take that feedback. You can keep putting your um, your uh, answers to question one and two. And um, I will make uh, the further sessions by keeping the space infections in mind. I'll try and show you some 3D things so that it becomes easy. Okay, orbit and condylar fracture is hard. I've tried to make it a little simple, Keval, uh, by taking the difficult parts. And still, if it is uh, difficult, you can go and watch the videos. And further in our um, further sessions, I will try and take orbit more for you, okay? And condylar fractures also. All right. So thank you so much for your feedback.
keep putting your feedbacks those who have not yet put it and i will make a list of the topics and take it up in the further sessions all right happy learning